Thanks, everyone. OK. So this is me. I um, work for a company called Sable. We do fintech for construction. Absolutely nothing to do with this talk. Uh, if you want to find me online, here's some details. This is probably the important one if you're going to take a photo. Uh, I've only got 20 minutes. I have a lot of material, so links to other things, to the slides, to the code snippets and so on are all up on GitHub. That is the URL there. Just wait till everyone's got that. OK, so who was here last year? Show of hands, OK. Did you see Steve's talk, Alexa, the smart home vision is failing? Few of you I recognize. If not, not now, um, but, but later, go and have a look at the video. Really, really funny. So the good news is you do not need the terrible proprietary systems that Steve inflicted on himself. Um, if you want, there is a really, really good open source home automation system. So that is Home Assistant. Uh, it will run your house, charge your car, monitor everything, let you do fancy lights turning on and everything like that. That is a different talk. What I want to focus on today is just the data itself. So if you're not sure yet, if you want to go all in on Home Assistant, or you just want to dabble with gathering some data, or maybe you just need to learn some DevOps tools a bit better and need a good excuse and DevOps won't let you get the graphs of the production cluster or something, then um, home automation could be a good way to do that. So what, what data? So these are some of the things that you might be able to get quite easily. So how much power is your house using? Um, how does that vary over time? Uh, if you're one of the people that's got solar in your house already, you might want to know how much solar energy you're generating, how full is your battery, what's the temperature of your house, what's the humidity of your house, um, how has that changed? So these are all some of the data that you, that you could quite easily get and might be interested in. So those sort of things about power, about temperature, interesting eco-home questions, but also they're common-ish DevOps questions. So we can use the same tools. These are all graphs of my house, by the way. Uh, we can see which days uh, it was nice and sunny uh, in Oxford and which days it was uh, less sunny and the battery didn't charge. So unfortunately, a lot of the green tech and eco-home things that you can buy are half abandoned or worse. So. Uh, if you want to know more on that, Steve's talk again, uh, right to repair, whole different subject. I'm not going to touch on that either. But this is the monitoring provided by the manufacturer for my home solar and battery, featuring welcome null and a really, really cutting edge, up to date uh, display, as we can see. Um, alternately, if you log into the solar unit, this is the cutting edge data that we have. Now, I think I'm actually quite lucky because I can get this off of my solar system. I have another friend whose solar panels will cheerfully talk to a server in China, but refuse to give him anything at all. Exciting stuff. Um, but luckily, I do have this, and um, I'm also quite good with Python. So. DevOps monitoring tools are a lot better than that. So here we have a lovely graph with colors and axes, and you can control it and scroll around on it. DevOps tools are also supported. So last Grafana release was uh, about a month ago. The uh, last release on this was 2016. Bit of a difference there. Please do not hack my solar panels. They are not patched. <laughs> OK, so how do you get that data for your house? Might it be hard? Might it be expensive? Well, the good news is no. You might already have it. So if you've got solar panels like me, like Charlie, like some of the other ones in the room, your solar panels could already be capturing data on how much power is being generated in your house, how much is being used. Depending on what country you're in, you might be getting this from your smart meter or you might be getting it from your energy supplier's website. No guarantees, does vary, um, but you might be able to get that. Um, so I'm lucky. Otherwise, 
pre-built hardware, especially for temperature, is very cheap. So here we have about the cost of a beer for a little dongle and a temperature monitor. They're, they're terrifyingly cheap now. And these are prices delivered to my house. Um, they come in all sorts of exciting shapes and sizes, but I think basically there's two boards that power all of these. And um, I did some high-tech calibration, and they're all basically the same to within the margins of my cooking thermometer, which was good to know. So DIY hardware is even cheaper, even cooler. So the little Arduino units, anyone played with those? Got a few nods in the house? Okay. Um, they are basically th a beer for three of them these days, which is pretty cool, I think. If you look back 10 years ago at what they cost, they've come down in, power, in cost a, an awful lot. They are tiny, and these days they come with Wi-Fi and USB-C built in, so they're really easy to work with. Uh, you can use MicroPython, so you can code them in Python, or there's a sub-project of Home Assistant, which will basically build a custom firmware for your Arduino and flash it onto your Arduino for you that will feed in and all the data. So that's really cool. If you're good with a soldering iron, which I'm not really, then you can do some really great stuff. Otherwise, your favorite Chinese manufacturer of choice will, will ship you a load really cheaply. Only thing I'll say, if you're gonna build your own, 20 euro cents makes a huge difference in the quality of the temperature sensor. So maybe splash out a whole two euros on the temperature sensor and you'll, you'll get a bit of a difference. All right, otherwise, do not forget your early 2000s screen scraping. It might turn out that your solar panels were built in the early 2000s and therefore exactly the same terrible HTML still applies. And um, that Beautiful Soup will let you um, screen scrape and get the data out. Uh, you, you can basically um, reverse engineer a little API feed pretty easily if you're unlucky and don't get that API feed. So here we have a tiny bit of Python. Um, that's about a third of the code that gets the data off my solar panels. Okay, next little challenge for you with your home automation project is picking a radio ecosystem by which I mean basically Zigbee, Bluetooth low energy, Wi-Fi, or some sort of strange thing on a random frequency. So Zigbee, it's low power, it's got mesh networking built in, works pretty well. Dongles are very cheap. Um, you may already have some Zigbee stuff in your house if you've done anything with the Hue smart lights, IKEA lights, that sort of thing. You will probably already have some Zigbee in the house, you can cut that over. The nice thing is your smart lights will act as a repeater and a router for your network, helping the uh, signals from your tiny little battery-powered sensors go further. The only downside is you've got to make sure that you wired them right, because you want them to always be powered on, and if they're on the wrong end of a light switch and people keep turning your smart switch off, then your mesh has to re, um, reassociate each time, which is uh, an exciting um, failure mode. But on the whole, they work pretty well, they're pretty cheap, um, and Bluetooth Low Energy, um, it keeps changing its name. It seems to be Bluetooth Low Energy this week. It was Bluetooth Smart before. Um, it's not actually got very much to do with Bluetooth. Your Bluetooth dongle might also work for Bluetooth Energy, but you might need to get another dongle. It does some um, mesh networking. Um, you've got um, probably a lower chance of having the repeaters already in your house because the lights don't tend to work with it, but it does seem to be a little bit cheaper. Uh, and you might not already need a new dongle. Wi-Fi, everyone's favorite for connecting everything. Um, it's really aimed at high-powered devices, so ideally you're gonna want to be plugged into the mains or have a huge battery. So one of these will run for two years off a tiny little coin cell battery. Um, I think that'll get you about a day on typical Wi-Fi. There are a few tricks you can do, but on the whole it's, it's a much more heavyweight protocol. But on the other hand, it can talk straight to your Influx database or your MQTT directly. You don't need any gateways or anything in between. If you have especially proprietary devices talking on 433 or 868 megahertz, so for example, if you've got a, 
um, solar panels, and then you've got something that's going to realize when you're exporting to the grid and top up your hot water, and that'll probably be on one of these frequencies. There is some really great stuff out there where you can get a software-defined radio. It's basically a USB stick for TV. Uh, run some open source hardware on it, and you can decode all that. That's, that's pretty cool. So we've got some hardware. Now we need to get some data. If you're on Wi-Fi, sorted, easy, just off we go. If you're on Zigbee or Bluetooth, slightly different. These devices, battery powered, they wake up when they feel like it. If you, wrote the heart, if you wrote the code on them, you can choose that interval, but usually it's like every five minutes or so, they'll wake up, take a reading. If they think it's changed enough, then they'll ping some data over the radio. So you've got no control of when the values are going to appear, and you're going to need some kind of database and something in between. Um, the one I use is Zigbee 2 MQTT, which handles all the Zigbee radio stuff. Other things out there, Home Assistant's got all this built in, it's really great that will basically map between the Zigbee radio and an MQTT topic. Looks like this. Here you can see all the devices in my house. And you can see what temperature it was in my house when I took the screenshots. And it's, it's really cool because for each device, you get a list of um, values coming out when the device feels like it. You can see the temperature. You can see the humidity. Potentially, you can also see the air pressure. Um, and then if you've got smart lights, so you've got the IKEA lights or Hue lights, then you can also um, drag up little sliders around and make the color in your lounge change. Um, so you've got some data coming from the device to your computer. Then what? Well, this is a time series data. Um, so for long periods of time, you won't have any new values. You largely can't poll for values. Um, Prometheus, very popular in DevOps, but Prometheus believes that everything can be talked to at all times, which is usually the case for a data center. It's not the case for these little things here, and it's not even always true in the DevOps case, because if you've got a pod that's only going to be there for 10 seconds, Prometheus can't pull that. Um, the good news is that they also have a thing called Prometheus Push Gateway that's going to let you place the value on the push gateway, and then Prometheus can poll it. So that way, Prometheus can believe that it can always talk to your temperature sensor, even though your temperature sensor is asleep to save battery. So looks like this. Um, if you're interested in all the time series database, other ones exist. If you go back a few years on the website, there were a lot of talks about this kind of. Mm, uh, 2019, 2020, you'll find quite a lot there. It's especially a key part of any Internet of Things solutions. There's a lot of IoT vendors that are doing work on this, a bunch of open source databases for it. Uh, for me, I opted for InfluxDB, partly because the tutorial I was copying and pasting from used InfluxDB, and partly because Debian ship it. Um, so I went with that. Um, it is if you're on the old one on Debian and Ubuntu, there's no fancy UI. It's just a command line. That's, that's good for me, maybe not for everyone. So you've got your data. You've got it in a time series. You've got your data coming off the devices. You've got your time series database. You need to glue the two together. Um, unfortunately, things like uh, Grafana, Kibana, Datadog, they don't talk to MQTT. They're going to want the time series database in there. Luckily, Telegraph is a Swiss army knife of sort of patching data between systems and transforming it. I'm not sure I'd use it for a terabyte a day, but for 20 devices dotted around my house, it works beautifully. You can um, tell it to read from one device or one topic or one system, transform the data, uh, change how it looks, and then post it onto something else. So, for example, this is everything we need to read from MQTT, change the format, and then um, place some new tags on it. Um, it's, uh, I'd say it's pretty easy. Um, and then if we want to publish to InfluxDB locally and InfluxDB in the cloud and dump JSON onto the screen, well, again, it's, a, it's another page of config. So all of these um, stuff is on the slides, so you can have a look later. But I find that for, I need to read some data off MQTT, I need to transform it, I need to stuff it over there. It's, it's awesome for that. Or, you know, 
most geocoders, three lines of Python, you can lash something up. So graphing the data, Grafana, Kibana, both really good. I picked Grafana because that's what we were using at work at the time. And with um, about five minutes of work, you can get this kind of graph up, which is really cool. So this is connecting to the Influx database. It's reading the data out. Uh, we're picking which thing we, we do and showing off all sorts of different kinds of graphs that we have. So from the uh, thing provided by our solar manufacturer, you get nothing like that. And here we have in five minutes something I think looks, looks pretty good. Um, my wife is quite happy with that. It's a lot easier for her to use. She can see how we're doing. Um, and then mostly she can use it to say that we need to move somewhere much further south because it's not sunny enough in Oxford. <laughs> um, so we've got the, the graphing of the electricity in our house. And then we've also got the graphing of the temperature in our house. The top line is not a sauna. It's the uh, room in the house where we have the hot water tank. Um, and so we can see how it's all going on. You'll also see one green line that's really solid at the bottom. That's one device that I need to go and poke the uh, reset button on because it seems to have got a bit confused. So temperature monitoring uh, in room seems to work pretty well. In a cupboard, moderately well. The trouble is there's not much airflow around. So these devices have a very small little hole in them. And then if it's in a room with no airflow, then they are very slow to change and pick up on things. Entryway seems to work quite well. They seem to do some averaging. They don't seem to notice when you open and close the front door. Um, hot water, you can't do with the cheap devices. You're going to have to spend 20 euros on something that's going to connect to the hot water. So we just have a proxy. We just put one of these cheap sensors in the same little cupboard and go, well, the hot water is probably about 10 degrees warmer than the uh, air around it. Outside, again, you need to spend some money. These are not rated for outdoors. They're not even rated for getting wet. Um, if you want fast reporting, then you need one of the Wi-Fi ones. This will poll maybe three or four times an hour. That's not going to be good enough for adjusting your, your heating. So if you've got this data, you can change when your heating runs. You can maybe say, oh, every morning the sun comes out about 10 at this time of year. Maybe I can turn my heating off at 9, and then the sun will warm the house up the rest. Adjust your hot water. Identify where there's poor insulation. If you're thinking about getting a heat pump, you can maybe see if all the radiators in your house are big enough. Heat pumps run a bit cooler than gas central heating, so you might need to change one of your radiators to be able to get a heat pump in. But this gives you the, the baseline to make those changes. For electrical, you can maybe get some smart sockets, uh, get some little power clamps, and then you can monitor how much your cooker's using or your fridge is using. You can switch things on and off. And then if you're thinking about getting an electric car, again, you can get a baseline. How much is your house using? You can then pick the right, um, pick the right tariff. So some next steps. I'd say see if you've already got some data in your house. You might have some of these things. You might have solar. You might be able to get some data from your electricity provider. If you've got proprietary systems, see if you can get converters for them. Try and get the data. Try and use it yourself. Try and take control of it. And if not, uh, give yourself a budget of like three beers. Go on your favorite uh, website, buy some stuff, have a play. It's really good fun. It's really quick. And then we are almost out of time. I have some devices here. So come find me at 4 PM in the coffee break. I'll plug these in. I'll show you how it all works. I'll uh, let you query my house temperature sensors and um, see if I can inspire you to do some more. So once again, here are the slides. Everything that you might want is linked from that. Talk to me afterwards. Go home. Do something cool. Make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your insights. We have time left for one quick question. OK, if not, then oh, okay. we have one question. Hi, thanks for the talk. So we talked about a bit about temperature, kind of humidity sensors, solar sensors, et cetera. From, in your opinion, or from what you've tried, what is the hardest sensor to actually integrate within the system? Um, knowing how hot the water is in your radiators and in your hot water tank, because that needs uh, something that's going to be physically touching the pipes. You need to have flow moving through the pipes. 
This was a big problem when our boiler started playing up during the winter, because we wanted to know when we woke up in the morning if the hot water had been topped up during the night, and whether we'd have a nice warm shower or a shocking cold shower. Um, ended up just having to spend uh, spend more money and buy the the probes that sort of stick in to uh, a liquid, and then you can just tape that onto the outside of the pipe. That will give you some data, but annoyingly, that's 20 euros rather than two euros. But I think that's the big thing because these are all uh, based around simple air sensors, and that's the cheap stuff. Okay, come see me at four o'clock if you're interested in more. Thanks. <laughs>